Good morning, and welcome to Making Sense of It. I'm Mona Duncan, your moderator, and this program is our gift to you from the Glasser Institute for Choice Theory. Each week, we have a certified member tell us about some of the concepts of Dr. Glasser and explain how that they work to make life run so much more smoothly. And our we have an ongoing monthly presentation from Professor Robert Mar J. Martin, and he is here with us today. He is giving us a month-by-month -month chapter in his book of, um, what is it, Connect and Lead? Connect and Involve. Connect and Involve and uh, you're involved while you're leaving. So uh, today's topic is on scoring guides to increase quality work. So thank you all of you for being here and Robert, it's good to see you. So if you're ready, we'll let you take it away. Well, thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be back. And uh, I need to, okay. So we're, I guess we're about ready to start screen sharing. So this is our sixth meeting. And uh, so I'm going to share. And while you're sharing, I'll tell others that they can go back. These uh, recordings are no charge. You just need to sign up as being a member. And you could go back and look for them. And they'll have Robert's name on there on the dates that he has done the previous five. OK, so, so this is uh, from. Uh, based on chapter six um, in Connect and Involve, and it's about scoring guides and, and increasing student achievement. So just to give you a little background, so this is our sixth presentation in this series, and there's a continuing emphasis on big ideas and key skills needed for students to achieve, and in particular to do well on high stakes testing, because I know that's something that teachers are always concerned about and their principals are concerned about and their superintendents are about. So I think the big point here is, is that if you use Glasser's ideas, it's not going to take you away from achievement. It's going to take you toward achievement. And, and that's the big, the big message here. So there's a continuing emphasis on helping students to act responsibly, do quality work, and meet their basic needs. All three basic ideas in uh, Glasser's choice theory and reality therapy. Okay, so I have to start off with myself. Um, when I was working with, I'm a psychologist, and, and um, I've worked with uh, kids and teachers and parents in school and also pretty much, um, K through uh, 12 and then on behind uh, uh, done counseling with retired teachers and, and so on. Anyway, but in my teaching, I'd graded thousands of papers without letting students know what to do to improve. And when I learned about scoring guides, I realized, oh, this is a piece that I've been missing. And uh, so I started a little, 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 little to, at a time. And gradually I became more expert in it, not because I was perfect or because I had great ideas, but because just a little at a time over a period of years, I gradually uh, caught on to what I needed to do. And, and uh, that's what I wanna share with you today. So the first thing is to talk, to say a little bit about uh, the fact that there's a lot of problems with grading. Uh, one is grades tend to promote this, don't look back. Oh, I got whatever, uh, I got a B, a B, I got an A, I got a C, I got an F, but I don't wanna look at it. Uh, another is trying to guess what the teacher likes. Another is self-labeling. Well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a C student or, well, I'm an A student, how come I didn't get an A? So we want to go on and see the approach that focuses on evaluation rather than grading. So scoring guides are a way of evaluating student work uh, without 
uh, and giving a grade, uh, but without emphasizing grades. But they can also be so much more. So scoring guides can help you identify the products and performances that demonstrate student learning. They can involve students in doing quality work. And it makes your evaluation and then your grading more consistent and easier and faster. And then finally, it can increase achievement. So how do you get quality work? This is a big class or theme in his work in the quality school. The first is you need to define quality work for each product or performance. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The second thing is providing quality examples for each product or performance that students need to be involved in. And that's something we don't always do or even usually do. The big thing I would focus on is the idea that simple products need simple scoring guides, simple examples and short discussions about what they need to do. And obviously as you get more complex, that's gonna, it's gonna be more difficult. The big thing is you wanna use scoring guides before students create a product or a performance. You wanna show lots of examples and discuss them or what we really mean here is having students discuss them. One of the things students, uh, there's always this concern by teachers, well, if I show students good examples, won't they just copy them? Well, no, if you show them lots of examples, um, they're not just going to copy it word, word for word, but they'll copy the idea is, oh, it needs to be like this. So, just to jump back for a moment. The difference between evaluation and grading, this is something we all know, but you know, we kind of get away from it. And it's something that students don't generally understand and in the same way with parents. And that is an evaluation is a judgment of quality. A grade on the other hand is a number or a letter that we attach to the judgment of, of quality. So the first thing that we want to have students doing in self-evaluating their work is not grading themselves, but getting themselves to think about, well, how good is this? Could I make this better? Okay, I'm going to give you a second here to take a look at uh, a familiar scoring guide. I hope this brings a smile to your face. This has been shown up over 50 years in different, in different forms. Uh, a rubric for Superman, uh, is he faster than a speeding bullet or just faster than a speeding turtle? Uh, if you want to be like uh, Superman, then you can judge yourself based on, uh, on this uh, scoring guide. So scoring guides are a very old idea. And we just finished the Olympics. So how about that? The Olympics use scoring guides. And... Uh, when the scoring guides are are discussed, it's like, well, why did you why did you get a nine or why did you get an eight? It's like, okay, it's based on how well you did a uh, a series a, a number of different criteria. Okay, so teachers can teach how to do quality work and teach students how to eval evaluate and teach big ideas and key skills needed to achieve and do well on high stakes testing. These all go together. They're, they're, they're all kind of really interact with each other. So how do we get there? I'm gonna move this out of the way here. Okay. So the first idea is the fact that quality work is always a concept. And concepts are learned through learning the definition and then evaluating good examples and poor examples. And what the definition is, is the scoring guide. So we saw with Superman, okay, well, these are the things, these are the criteria that you have to do if you want to be a superhero like, uh, like Superman. 
So we need to help students learn what these things are. Okay. So what we wanna do is to give students some good examples and have them use the scoring guide to score good examples and poor examples. Through doing that, they come to understand the scoring guide and then they can also use the scoring guide to do quality work. A lot of teachers use scoring guides, but they don't always have the students use the scoring guides. And we learn by what we do. So the way to understand what the teacher is doing is to do it yourself. So when you, as a student, score some examples and then score your own work, then you really learn what quality is. So through scoring their own work and then revising it, that's the next thing. And this is a big thing class was always focused on. You need to let students revise their work, especially if it's something where there are big ideas and key skills involved in the particular task. And you always wanna give students tasks that involve them in big ideas and key skills that they're gonna to need to do well. Okay, so, and again, scoring guides also make the teacher evaluation and grading faster, easier, more systematic, more explainable to students and parents and administrators uh, in terms of like, okay, well, this is what you're great. There are always students who, who are unhappy, they're always parents who are happy and then they come into the administrator, it's like, I don't think this was fair. It's like, how did you grade this? Well, then you have a way of explaining, okay, well, the, these are the criteria. Uh, this, is, this is how it's graded. Okay, so making a scoring guide. First thing to ask is, what is the product or the performance to be evaluated? Everything that we, evaluate students on is either a performance of some sort or a product that we're looking at, they're turning in and so on. And then the second thing is, what are the criteria for that particular product or performance? And sometimes that can be a little difficult to figure out. So the easiest way to start is find and modify scoring guides in your areas that, okay, this uh, scoring, okay, this, this got a little bit messed up because I'm trying to move this stuff at the bottom around. Okay, fine. So what you wanna do is you wanna have the big idea and the key skills, and then what are some of the ways to demonstrate that? So let me give you an example. This probably doesn't apply to you, but that's okay because you're gonna use, you're gonna to go to other teachers, you're gonna go online and then modify what you've already seen. So here's, here's just a very simple uh, scoring guide for writing a story. Some of the big ideas that you wanna be able to grade for. The story has some beginning, a middle and an end. There's a colorful imagery and concrete detail. Then all the mechanics like complete sentences punctuation, spelling, grammar, that they're also in there too. And uh, then this is very, very clear, especially after students have created a paper or two to see, oh, that's what it's all about. Okay, so that's basically it. But there's some keys to using scoring guides. And let me just go through those very quickly. The first thing is to have students evaluate their own work and one another's work to help one another improve. I would emphasize very, very strongly, you're never, never, ever having students grade one another or themselves. It gets into ethical problems. It gets into game playing. It gets into objections from parents, et cetera, et cetera. So this is key idea. 
evaluation to see, okay, what can we do to improve here? Let's help each other. Uh, but we're never going to grade each other and we're not going to make negative comments. We're going to focus on what can we do to improve. And to do this, you're going to need to first collect some examples of excellence. And then you're going to share these with students. And then you're going to have the students rate the examples using the scoring guide. And uh, you can probably come up with uh, examples over a series of years. As your students do good work, you can get, and always like to get written permission from the students that it's okay to share their examples without their names, unless they really want their names shared. And so you begin to collect a library of excellent examples that students can use. Now, obviously this is for, for more complex uh, <clears throat> products. You don't need to do this for, uh, for everything. Okay, so the idea here is you need to have students revise because revising lets students make improvements and the scoring guys let them know what they need to improve. So it's a circular kind of thing. Okay, to summarize here, a little extra time up front is going to really make a big difference. Uh, this does take a little bit of extra time uh, up front, but when you do this, then you're gonna increase your ability to teach big ideas and key skills because students are going to be practicing and that's gonna lead to increased achievement. So the teacher steps, just to review, you're gonna make a scoring guide or just modify one that you find from other teachers uh, or online, there are lots and lots of these things. Some schools actually have collections of these. You're gonna have students score examples of excellence. You're gonna have students score and revise their own work. You're gonna evaluate the student work. And if it's appropriate, you can have them revise again. And then you're gonna revise your scoring guide. And it's gonna take a few times. It may take a, some, a couple semesters or a couple years uh, to revise the scoring guide two, three, four times. Because each time you do this, you're gonna see something. Oh, this could be a little better if I do such and such. The big thing is go for the low hanging fruit. It, it doesn't have to be perfect the first time. Do what's easiest first. Keep it simple, don't overthink it, and then revise the scoring guide after you've used it. From the student's point of view, what you're trying to get them to do is practice using the big ideas and the key skills by scoring examples of excellence, which always requires them to think. Always love what Classer said about basically, Thinking is always a good idea. Scoring one another's work without grading, with focus on what can be improved, scoring their own work, then revising their own work. So if you take small steps over time, you'll become an expert. Uh, and it'll happen over a period of years. It took me quite a long time to do this with all of my uh, assignments. And uh, that was okay. You do a little bit each, each week and over a period of time, you start getting better at doing it. The big thing is not to lay down a big ambitious project that you just get discouraged. It's like New Year's resolutions. They're almost always way too big. So I always emphasize this with teachers, uh, with clients, with students. It's like, well, let's, let's start with something simple. What's the easiest thing we can do? Uh, and part of this is a psychological thing. We don't always wanna do the thing that's the easiest, but when you pick something difficult, then you immediately feel resistance. 
oh, I'll never be able to do this, or this is too hard, or I don't have enough time, or this is too much work, and so on. So the point is to reduce the amount of uh, work that you give yourself where you don't feel any resistance. It's like, oh, okay, this will be easy, and hey, I'll revise it later. You'll be fine. Okay, if you're interested in a free copy of more uh, about what's in the book, you just write to me and I'll send you some information. And here's some information on getting a discount from the publisher if you're interested in that. So anyway, and uh, then here's a, some uh, photo credits from some of the fun things that I was able to include, the pencils and, and, uh, and so on. So I hope, hope you enjoyed that and found, found it uh, found the power. I try to make the f PowerPoints fun as well as in informative. So thank you very much. Okay, Robert. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So you think that uh, thinking is always a good idea? Well, that was something that I really, yes, I mean, but that was also something that I really liked that Glasser liked to say. And that was thinking is always good. And we should always try to get students thinking. Okay, I'll stop sharing now if I, and then we can kind of return to, yeah. Right, right. And then when you were talking there about giving examples and that uh, the students may copy those ideas, but that's okay because what? They'll add their creativity to it? Absolutely. And when you show people a lot of examples, it's like going to an art museum. It's like what art teachers do. They show a bunch of examples and it's like, oh, I can use ideas from this, but I'm not gonna copy an example uh, because I've seen a lot of different examples. They're, gonna, they, they're always gonna do it in their own way. Right, right. And I really appreciated the way that you talked about quality versus judgment. And they learn that through self-evaluation. Right, they learn what quality is by making judgments about, oh, this is, this is good. Well, this is not as good here. Well, this could be improved. Oh, well, this is how I could improve. Uh, we just don't realize that quality is always a concept. It's like the Olympics. For every single event of the Olympics, there's a separate set of criteria. And one of the things I think that's great about the Olympics is that they try to teach you as you're watching, well, what are the criteria? Why, did, why wasn't this particular performer as good as this other one? And so uh, you watch lots of examples and you learn, oh, well, this is what quality is for this event. Right, and then that goes hand in hand with the scoring guide with uh, being faster than the speeding bullet or the car or the- <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly, yes. And so, as you can see, I'm doing it, but I'm not at that at that quality yet. Right, exactly, yeah. So then you can judge in a non-judgmental way how to improve so that it will be quality. Exactly. So I would never give the, a grade at the, until the very end. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And, and then I mean, a grade is a philosophical kind of thing. It's like, well, does this paper deserve an A for effort, even though it's not perfect, or uh, a D because this person could have done a lot better? I mean, uh, a grade is, there's a lot of philosophical sort of ideas that go into that, whereas evaluation is more systematic. It's more like, what can we do to improve? And I think that's a key idea of, of uh, the quality school is how can we improve? And by the way, these same yeah, supervisors use these same ideas uh, for uh, evaluating their employees, the, the people who work under them. So scoring guides, regardless of what they're called, are used all through business and industry as well as, as in schools. Right, because you need something as a guideline. Exactly, yes. This is what you need to do to keep this job, yes. yes. And I hear you giving students permission to do over. Absolutely, and I think that was a, for me was a big point of that Classer made. And that was, 
that you need to let students improve. You need to let them revise because that's where the real learning comes in. Uh, always give them a chance to do better. Right. As Dr. Glasser said in Every Student Can Succeed, he said, we do not learn from our mistakes. We learn from correcting our mistakes. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Robert, you have given us some excellent ways to connect and to uh, lead and to improve and to make things better. So we'll go ahead and thank you for being here and look forward to next month again. We'll be doing another chapter seven for us and we'll close out for today and then we'll chat with those that are, that are here live. So thank you for being here for the recorded session and many blessings and good evaluating. And thank you.